I'm Tony Clark from the Carter Presidential Library and Museum. I'm really glad that you all could join us tonight. This is a program that uh, we ended up postponing. It was going to be the end of October, and that's when the power was out here at my place and uh, also around much of Georgia. And as it turns out, it's really even more timely right now because we're talking about um, historic black uh, colleges and university and the vice president elect is uh, a graduate of, of one of those. So this is just, this is a really timely uh, talk tonight. Jelani Favors is an associate professor of history at Clayton State University. He's the author of Shelter in a Time of Storm, How Black Colleges Fostered Generations of Leadership and Activism, which is, as I say, I think even more timely now. The book won the 2020 Lillian Smith Book Award, sponsored by the University of Georgia Libraries and the Southern Regional Council. Uh, it was a finalist for the 2020 Pauli Murray Award, sponsored by the African American Intellectual History Society. And we're very fortunate tonight to have the AJC's Ernie Suggs with us to be in conversation with Jelani. Ernie has been at the AJC since 1997, uh, currently covering race and culture, as well as breaking national news, investigative stories. And in fact, I think we probably just pulled him away from some election coverage uh, as well. He's a veteran of nearly 30 years as a newspaper reporter. Porter, uh, covering things from politics to civil rights to higher education. He manages the AJC's award-winning Black History Month project, and he's also a 2009 uh, Harvard Neiman Fellow. So gentlemen, thank you very much for being here, and uh, I'm eager to hear uh, about the historically, uh, historically Black colleges and universities. Ernie? All right. Thank you very much, Tony. Thanks for having me. And welcome, Jelani. I hope you're doing well, my friend. Doing great, man. Now, one thing now, now Tony has invited me to um, to moderate these book discussions several times over the years. And I'm not sure if I would have accepted this. And for all of you, all of you who understand historically black colleges, I'm not sure if I would have accepted this had I known earlier that you're a graduate of North Carolina A&T State <laughs> University. <laughs> <laughs> Aggie pride, man. <laughs> What's going on? Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm a graduate of North Carolina Central University, and a and is our rival like Duke and Carolina or Georgia and Georgia Tech or Alabama and LSU. But I welcome you here, and it's a, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. Absolutely. Hopefully, we can keep the conversation civil this evening. Uh, hopefully, so, hopefully. <laughs> we're going to get it, going at it. <laughs> so, okay, so tell me, okay, so first of all, let's, let's so before we frame the conversation, Let's you give your definition or the definition. Am I gone? Are you gone? No, I'm here. Okay. Yep. Um, let's give the let's give the, the the viewers a definition of what an HBCU is. What a historically black college is. So HBCU stands for historically black college and university. Uh, it's actually a designation um, that didn't formally appear until the late 1960s, early 1970s. It became well, actually a, a federal uh, um, denotation, uh, but Black colleges have been around since 1837, which of course I talk about in my book. So um, these are institutions which were forged out of necessity. Uh, clearly for it was illegal to, to educate uh, enslaved black people. Uh, and not only that, but free black folks, they, they didn't really wanna educate them either. So, uh, but it was in 1837 that the first uh, black college of what, or what will become a black college uh, was formed in the Institute for Colored Youth uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was after that uh, that we saw two other institutions emerging in the antebellum North. You had Wilberforce in Ohio uh, and Lincoln University also in Philadelphia. So you had these trio of schools uh, which were created specifically uh, and, and purposefully to educate African-Americans, uh, even again, even before slavery comes to an end. And so, uh, but it's after slavery ends in 1865 that we see a rush of new institutions be created in the Deep South, beginning with Shaw University in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, 
uh, and a plethora of other black colleges begin to emerge. And if, again, it, it feels a, a need and necessity um, to educate a group of people who, again, once it had been illegal to educate, but moreover, black folks saw this as a, a lever of mobility, that they could pull that lever, that they could ascend into society, and more importantly, they could equip the young people who attended these institutions with all the intellectual tools that they would need to take on white supremacy and Jim Crow. And that's, that's a major part of the legacy of these institutions. One of the interesting things about HBCUs that I've found, and I, you know, I'm a, of course I'm a graduate, and I've written about them for a long time, is that you know everybody considers and everybody thinks about HBCUs as a Southern creation, as something that's you know endemic to the South. But right. you know, from your research and from obviously from what's going on with Lincoln and Cheney and Wilberforce, and they were all started before the end of the Civil War. These are kind of like a Northern invention invention that came about in the South in right with Shaw University in 1865. So talk about just how they were, obviously for obvious reasons, they couldn't have started in the South before 1865 because of the war and slavery and things of that nature. But why was it so important for these colleges to be started even, you know, 30 something years before the end of the Civil War, before the end of slavery? Right, well, as you noted, it was illegal to, to educate enslaved African Americans. And, um, but the other part of that story, and this is one of the things that I always charge my students with and encourage them to think more critically about, is that the North was no picnic either, right? You know, free black folks in the North were struggling to remain free. Uh, free black folks in the North were often, uh, um, uh, again, created, uh, are, are uh, cr uh, treated in a very hostile manner. Uh, and so again, the name of the book is Shelter in a Time of Storm. And that's exactly what these institutions really became. They became spaces, again, not just educated young Black Americans in, in Greek and in math and science, but also, again, gave them a charge to become deeply involved in the liberation of Black people. So when you look at a city like Philadelphia, which, again, the Institute for Color Youth founded in in 1837, and again, this is something I talk about in that first chapter, Philadelphia was an extremely hostile city. Um, to black folks. There were a lot of race riots that occurred um, throughout the North in the 1830s, in the 1840s, and in, in the 1850s. So this build up to the Civil War, African Americans, again, not only were they struggling and fighting to remain free in the North, uh, but they were also asserting the fact that they were human uh, and that they had a right um, to exist. They, again, these institutions played a critical role in helping to champion the idea that black folks should be citizens uh, and that black folks should have freedom rights, property rights. These are all things that, that, that young black folks were being encouraged to not just think about, but being prepared to serve as, as agents for change. And so, again, Wilberforce, Institute for Colored Youth, uh, and, 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 and uh, Lincoln University, and I always throw in the honorary HBCU Oberlin. Oberlin was, of course, a, a school in, in Ohio. It wasn't an HBCU, it wasn't a black college at all, but it was one of the few institutions where black people could be educated. And, and so there were a number of black people attending this institution in Ohio, and many of them went on to serve in teacher roles. I talk about Fannie Jackson Coppin uh, in, the, in my chapter on Institute for Colored Youth. Uh, mm -hmm. She came from Oberlin. Uh, and she arrived in Philadelphia, teaches at the Institute for Colored Youth, eventually becomes the principal, the head president, if you will, mm -hmm. of the Institute for Colored Youth. So again, th these institutions play a critical role in advancing the early, what I call the early civil rights movement long before slavery has even come to an end in 1865. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, um, and I want to get, I want to talk about two, the title of your book in two ways. But the first way you talk about shelter in a time of storm. Mm -hmm. how, were, how was an HBCU a shelter in a time of storm for you? And I guess what what's your origin story in terms of how you what led you to uh, A and T? Oh, this is this is one of those church moments where I get to testify <laughs> <laughs> and say what HBCUs have been in my life. I actually took that title from, uh, and of course, if you are raised in the church, this would be of no surprise. Uh, that's an old gospel hymn, "Shelter in the Time of Storm." Uh, and so I wanted to find a way to talk about how these institutions served as enclaves. Uh, in the midst of racial violence, in the midst of the worst of Jim Crow, um, black colleges were carving out spaces where, again, the young freedom dreams of black youth um, could be nurtured uh, and could uh, could run free. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm a part of that legacy. Uh, you know, I 
I was born and raised, you know, in, at a and I'm sure this is going to hit you in, in your sweet spot, Ernie. <laughs> but at a and we say Aggie born, Aggie bred, and when we die, we'll be Aggie dead. And I was Aggie born. My mother and my father both attended North Carolina a and State University. Mm -hmm. uh, they met there. Uh, and they ultimately, of course, you know, got married and had two kids there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, you know, black colleges was never a mystery to me. I, they were always in my life. I attended preschool at Winston-Salem State University, another HBC located in Winston-Salem. Uh, but these institutions, they train so many of the people who came into my life, teachers, uh, ministers, uh, folks I knew in my community. Um, so you could, you know, one of the, the popular sentiments is that you can't go to HBCU and you can't do well for yourself and you can't uh, uh, succeed in, soci in society. And of course that never made sense to me because I had all of these examples of black success surrounding me who were all products of HBCUs from my father and my mother to again, an extended network of, of friends and family. So um, so going to a black college meant everything uh, for me. And you know, I actually uh, was doing an interview before this while I was telling uh, the interviewer uh, that I actually trans and and I, I talked with you about this earlier, Ernie, and you're probably going to give me give me a fit about it. But and, and apologies in advance to all the Aggies uh, uh, on the call. But I actually attended North. I went to North Carolina Central first. Uh, my freshman year, I went. To, I, I attended North Carolina Central because I thought they had, and they do have a strong liberal arts program. Uh, but then my father passed away, and so I transferred to ANTB to be a little closer closer to home. Again, I was born and raised in Winston Salem. Uh, but it's something about that nurturing environment. You know, I, again, I, I mentioned this to a, a earlier interviewer um, that I had professors who believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. Mm -hmm. I had professors who pulled me, who pushed me, who dragged me towards success and showed me a model of black excellence. Uh, and that matters. Um, mm -hmm. That matters then, it matters now. That's what HBCUs have done since their inception. They have given models of success uh, for, for black youth. Uh, and so that's my, my story. I wouldn't be where I am today um, without North Carolina a and but not just North Carolina a and I wouldn't be where I am today without all of the people who were shaped and molded by HBCUs who played a critical role in my life, again, from teachers, ministers, mentors, uh, people who, again, showed me what was possible mm -hmm. in society. Now, I grew up in North Carolina as well. I grew up in Rocky Mount, and I went to North Carolina Central, of course. And, you know, and you probably can concur with this, but, you know, growing up, we had this great advantage of, of watching ACC basketball and knowing <laughs> colleges and knowing UNC and knowing Duke yeah. and visiting all these campuses, plus having 11 HBCUs in North Carolina. So right. what, with your parents going to um, A&T and with you growing up on the Winston salem State's campus somewhat, um, was it ever a consideration for you to go to a predominantly white school or was it always you were going to a black college? Honestly, it never crossed my mind. Oh, really? I, I applied to two institutions uh, when I was prepared to graduate from high school, North Carolina Central and North Carolina a and and, and again, I really chose Central just to kind of stick it to my parents. Cause again, a and runs so deep in my family. My, my brother went to a and my mother, my father, uh, cousins, uh, uh, and extended family members, friends I grew up with. So I wanted to do something different. And so I went to North Carolina Central, but I never, it never, Cross my mind. And again, like you said, you know, growing up in North Carolina, you know, it's and the same thing is the case with Georgia. You know, you grow up and you follow, you know, the sports teams that are on TV. And, you know, I was a Carolina basketball fan. I still am, Tar Heels. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, also my father played football at AT. That's how he got to AT. So I grew up going to AT football games regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I still am a very passionate North Carolina a and football fan and basketball fan. I support my alma mater. So, again, it never even dawned upon me to, to think twice about going to another institution. But I, again, I knew what models of success I had before me. Uh, and I, I wanted to follow within that within those footsteps. So you couldn't tell me that, oh, you, you'll get a better job if you go to North Carolina State. Right. You, you can succeed well if you go to Chapel Hill. Right? I, I knew people who succeeded and uh, did extremely well who went to HBCUs. As you said before, we've got a number of HBCUs all across the state of North Carolina. So yeah. models of black excellence who attended HBCUs, that, that is something that was present before me, and not just before me, but in front of a number of my peers who also made that decision to go to black colleges as well. Mm -hmm. I see a bunch of your Aggies are joining in. So, um, <laughs> Aggie pride. 
So let's talk about the subtitle of your book, uh, How Black Colleges Foster Generations of Leadership and Activism. But before we get into that deeply, I want to get into how that affected you. You went to A&T, of course, mm -hmm. February 1st, 1960. We all know the story about the Greensboro Four. So talk about just your coming on campus and having that history there, how that influenced you as a freshman or as, you know, how, how it influenced you, how it influenced your family and how it influenced your research. So Tell us that's the real Greensboro Four is. Well, we, we at ANT we call it the ANT Four. Okay, <laughs> not, the, not the Greensboro Four, uh, but the ANT Four. You know that that's. I mean, talk about legendary. Um, talk about iconic. Talk about revolutionary. Um, this was a moment in history which transformed the world, right? And, and and there are very few institutions who can say that moments like that and and and, and alumni like that emerge from their institutions. But ANT can say that it played a critical role in, in transforming um, uh, uh, the trajectory of the civil rights movement. Uh, we moved into a direct action phase of the movement with the advent of the sit-ins. Prior to that, we're talking boycotts, we're talking about legal legislation uh, through the Supreme Court and others. That was the path in which most black folks were pursuing towards justice. But it was these young people emerging from, from A&T who decided to engage in these sit-ins, uh, who brought this dramatic confrontation as my good friend Taylor Branch talks about in his work, a dramatic confrontation with the Jim Crow system. Uh, and that was a psychological river, a deep psychological river of fear that generations of black folks had not been ready to cross. Mm -hmm. But it was these four students. And I always tell people when I talk about this and lecture about this, February 1st is a very important date. But really, the most important date is February the 2nd. OK. Right? Because if those students come back to campus, and tell what their, their peers, what they had done, and it falls flat, and, and, and their peers choose not to, to, to go back to, to Woolworths with them on February the 2nd, then we don't have this story. But what happens is they go back into this environment, which is rich with, again, race consciousness and a sense of, of activism, and their fellow students respond. Uh, and the next day doesn't show up. And, and the next day after that, even more show up. And Bennett College is a part of that story. And once the same state gets in and North, North Carolina Central gets in and all of a sudden you have a movement emerging. And so getting back to your original question, Ernie, you know, when I, when I arrived at grad school at, at Ohio State University in 1997, I graduated from, from a and in 97 and went directly to grad school. When I got to grad school, I didn't want to talk any more about the city. <laughs> I didn't want to talk anything. I, I said, you know what, I've been exposed to some, we talked about it a lot at a and We and we studied it a lot at, at a and And so when I got to, to Ohio State, um, I, I wanted to do something different. But again, I, I had mentors and advisors who said, you know what, this is really right ground. It's very fresh ground that really hasn't truly been explored. explored. We don't really know a lot enough about the legacy of black colleges uh, mm -hmm. and how they, they generated activism. And so, uh, you know, I said, I, I, okay, I, I'll take a second look. And, and uh, you know, I was interviewing Jabril Kazan, uh, mm -hmm. also known as Ezell Blair Jr. I was fortunate enough, blessed enough to interview one of the a and four. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was interviewing him as a young grad student in 1997, 98, uh, for my master's thesis, which which was focused on A&T and the student movement there. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, I'm paraphrasing here, but you know, he said to me, and this is one of those aha moments that I had as a researcher. He said to me, he said, you know, um, uh, it was really the, it was the teachers who shaped me and molded me. It was the teachers uh, in my segregated school system who, who, who forced me to, to believe in myself and to think about myself as an agent of change. And then he said something which, again, knocked me out of my seat. He said, this is before Rosa Parks came along. This is before Martin Luther King Jr. came along. This is what I was taught in my segregated school system in Greensboro, North Carolina. And again, that, that's the story that hadn't been told because again, we don't know those teachers' names. We know Rosa Parks. We know Ralph Abernathy. We know Michael Max. We know Dr. King. But it, again, here is one of the AT4 saying it was his teachers who really planted those seeds within him. And that led me in a, in a, in a, in a path of inquiry, inquiry to say, well, who are these teachers? Mm -hmm. Who taught them? 
Where do they get this model and this mindset of going about instilling these seeds of agency and activism with young, within young people like Ezell Blair Jr. And, and, and the project really kind of began to take a life of its own moving forward from there. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about the civil rights movement, but I want to go back for a second before we get into that. We, you know, let's let's look at February 1st, 1960 as a, as a, as a mark. But what was going on in black colleges in terms of activism before that? Uh, I'm, I'm, that's, that's something, you know, my, my book looks at seven different institutions mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at different periods uh, um, along the chronological timeline. So again, Cheney State goes from 1837 to 1877, the beginning of Reconstruction. I then take up the story of Tougaloo, which goes from its founding in the late 1860s all the way up to 1900. And then I talk about Bennett College during this era that I refer to as the New Negro Era. Mm -hmm. But the next three schools that I talk about, I specifically wanted to hone in and talk about this post-war, pre-war period, right? And so from World War I to World War II, that's the area that we didn't really know a lot about. In fact, that's the area where, you know, a Times, a New York, not a New York Times journalist, but a, um, a Times Magazine journalist, I want to say in 1954, referred to that generation as the silent generation. Okay. Right, the young people, that they're silent, that they're not being active, they're not being engaged. And again, the primary source that I consulted the most in pulling this, this work and this research together was student newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, student newspapers had not really been fully explored uh, by previous historians who had written about black colleges. Um, but when you open up these student newspapers, you, you have a gold mine of evidence of what and who these students were being exposed to. And one of the most explosive and radical periods was this from the end of the New Negro era, from the 1930s into the 1940s into the 1950s. And so the next three chapters of my book, following at Bennett College, I specifically talked about three schools within that era. I talked about Alabama State University, I talked about Jackson State University, and I talked about Southern University, all three state institutions. But when you look at that particular era, right, uh, again, radicalism, the idea of race consciousness, um, the the post-war, the 1945 moving into the 1950s, you see a lot of post-war radicalism. Students, you know, embracing what they refer to as the double V campaign, mm -hmm. double victory. Once again, we've been asked to go and to, to, to launch an attack against the Nazis and, and, and later on the communists. But what about our oppressors right here at home? That's mm -hmm. what the double V campaign really stood for. And black college students during the 30s, 40s, and 50s, again, it's sort of a, a, a World War II era moment, uh, they fully embraced the, the, these concepts and ideas, though. And so, you know, that era, that period, that historical time, time period, um, that really has not been fully filled in. And again, I found an abundance of evidence showing exactly how radical, how politicized students were, were really uh, becoming during that era, and that laid the groundwork for the civil rights movement. Again, we should stop thinking of the fact that, oh, these four students at A&T all of a sudden just kind of got up and, and, and decided to go and, and start a, mo a moment and a movement, right? The, the, the groundwork had been laid long before that. And again, there's evidence of that at, at, at a number of HBCUs, not just the three that I talked about, but what and who these students were being exposed to were extremely radical. Mm -hmm. In terms of your research, it was interesting you mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the school newspapers. Was that information difficult to find, to tracking down that kind of archival research? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, again, I mentioned this in the, in the, um, in the acknowledgments of my book. I, I give a huge shout out um, to Black College Archives, but at the same time, uh, I bemoan the current state of Black College Archives. We do a horrible job in preserving our history. Um, we do a horrible job at oftentimes celebrating our history uh, and acknowledging that history. And Black College archives are underfunded. Uh, they're understaffed. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes tell the story of the Institute for Colored Youth, the ICY. Uh, when I first arrived there to begin research in 2009 on fellowship at Duke and I arrived to begin to kind of dig through these archives, I'm digging through this old rusted out file cabinet mm -hmm. um, and I felt an obstruction uh, it, it, behind the cabinet. And I reached back to pull out and see what this is, this kind of preventing the cabinet from closing. And I pull it out and it's a handwritten letter 
from W.E.B. Du Bois to the college president. Wow. Right? wow. And I, I was floored, you know, and of course, I immediately sought out the archivist and said, Yo, what is going on? Like, <laughs> you know, we got to and of course, and he was new to the job. And of course, he, he thanked me. But I mean, these are these are the type of conditions that, that HBCUs and HBC archives often struggle with. And of course, that's on the extreme level. But mm -hmm. there's still a number of black archives which are struggling. And so and in fact, I also mentioned this in the acknowledgments of my book. Um, there were there were a couple of uh, school people always ask me, well, why did you choose this school? And why did you choose that school? There were actually a number of schools that didn't make the book. Um, and that I intended to make the book, um, largely because I had to cut them out because the archives were handicapped. The archives mm -hmm. either couldn't allow me to uh, 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 full um, uh, access, or you know they only open like two or three times out of the week. Yeah. Um, and so that, you know this is a major challenge. Um, uh, but for those institutions that I that were a part of the study, um, the black college newspapers that I were able to, that I was unable to uncover, just held again a gold mine of evidence of showing again who these students are being exposed to, who's visiting campus. Right, that's the other thing about it, is that you know these institutions they were part of the the uh, the lecture circuit, and yeah, so yeah. when you you see Carter B. Woodson on campus and yeah. W. E. P. Du Bois on campus and Mary McLeod Bethune comes to give a talk, right? I mean that matters. Right? It yeah. shows how these students are being politicized and who they're being exposed to. And black college newspapers, they display that better than anything. And they also give voice to students because mm -hmm. students were writing editorials within these newspapers and expressing themselves and talking about, again, democracy and citizenship and challenging white supremacy in the 40s, in the mm -hmm. 1950s. Right again, this is an era which we don't often associate with militancy in black youth, but that's exactly what was going on on black college campuses during this era. And black college newspapers expose that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let's go back to the '60s. Um, while this, while you guys at A and T were doing your thing, there was a bunch <laughs> of students down in Tennessee, led by you know guys like John Lewis and Diane Nash and Bernard Lafayette, who were who were part of the uh, what's the Nashville Student Movement. Or doing the thing as well. So talk about just how like the A and T movement and what was going on in Tennessee kind of spurred this kind of new activism that carried throughout the '60s at, at HBCUs. Well, again, Our university with um, the founding of um, SNCC. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, what these students do so well, um, and, and and it's a courageous moment that should not be um, should not be under uh, underestimated. As I said before, these students cross a deep river of psychological fear. For generations, black youth have been told, have been instructed, you know, and I'm, I'm being completely honest and frank here. Look, don't don't fool with these white people. Right? Yeah. Don't go in that store. Don't make trouble. Right? Yeah. Why? Because racial violence was real. Mm -hmm. Racial violence defined the lives of generations of black people. And they knew that crossing the color line was something which could very much invoke racial violence. But all of a sudden, on February 1st, 1960, you get through this in mass. And I say in mass because February 1st, 1960 wasn't the first sit in. There were other mm -hmm. uh, attempts at sit ins in, in mm -hmm. other institutions and in other spaces. But what's so important about February 1st is that it, it creates this domino effect, right? From Greensboro to Winston Salem to Durham ultimately to, to Rock Hill, South Carolina, to Atlanta, Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, the movement of explosive, and then of course to Nashville. And again, I think what's so vitally important about all that, and, and this is a woman who cannot be overlooked, is the significance of Ella Baker. Yeah. Uh, and again, I talk about Ella Baker in, in that book, but it's Ella Baker who has the foresight and the courage to tell these students, to bring them together, to say, hey, look, let's have a meeting, we're going to have that meeting at my alma mater, Shaw University, again, another HBCU, mm -hmm. right? And let's talk about what can be moving forward, how what you have done is so radically different from what the NAACP was suggesting and, and what even the SCLC, which was a fairly new organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was suggesting. Because again, many of these organizations, particularly the NAACP, they weren't in favor of direct action protests. Mm -hmm. They were in favor of litigation, of, of taking this to the courts. But these students, as I said before, they take a step, which even Dr. King himself was not ready to do. Dr. King, 
uh, the Atlanta students tried to get him to come and engage in the first sit-ins, and he said yeah. no. Yeah. Right? He turns that down uh, out of fear. And again, it, as I said before, Taylor Branch acknowledges this in his book, saying that it was Dr. King who said, look, I've got to tip my hat. These students have found something. But again, going back to Ella Baker, it's Ella Baker who says, look, we need to harness this energy, bring this energy together, and out of that comes the most important organization of the 1960s, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. SNCC would be incredibly influential. It would be huge on the Black Power Movement later on, even mm -hmm. as it's beginning to crumble in 1965 and 1966. It still is extremely influential. It also influenced generations of young white students mm -hmm. right, who who become who are invited to become down and participate in, in Freedom Summer in 1964. Uh, so in that way, in that regard, it also helps to kind of springboard the anti-war movement and the peace movement during this era. Uh, and so again, this all comes back full circle to the significance and to the impact of black colleges. Because again, SNCC is largely comprised of black college students. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I think that one of the things that, you know, and if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat room. I think one of the things that when we talk about the civil rights movement, we talk about this kind of stuff, there's this assumption, we talk about Martin Luther King, there's this assumption that everybody was in favor of that, that everybody was marching, everybody was <laughs> king, all these students were doing their thing. But right. talk a little bit about just how, how many students were actually doing this or how brave they were to do this. And when I asked that question because of this, when John Lewis died, I went down to visit his family and I read his book and he talked about how his parents were embarrassed and his parents were ashamed of him, not because you know of what he was doing, but because he was getting arrested. Now he wasn't getting arrested for robbing a liquor store. He was getting arrested for being a social activist. But just that whole idea that their son that they sent to college was going to jail had an influence on his family. So he had, you know, he had to deal with that whole thing. So talk about just the pressure that some of these students were going through to do what they had to do and, you know, why they were doing it, why they thought it was so important. You know, one of my favorite finds um, that I came across in the, in the archives was a letter that was written uh, from Septima Clark. Septima mm -hmm. Clark was a very famous activist and organizer. Um, she worked with the Highland folk. Uh, uh, Center Highland Folk School in, in Tennessee. Um, she's from South Carolina, just extremely well known um, throughout the movement. But an older, she's part of that older generation. There's a letter from Septima Clark to Solomon Say, Reverend Solomon Say, who also is part of that older generation. He was a minister in Alabama. Dr. King gives him credit for being one of the few ministers who was willing to openly speak out against Jim Crow. But there's this correspondence between both of them that I came across in 1960, where they're writing to each other, and Solomon say, and I'm paraphrasing here, but Solomon say says to to, to Septimus Clark, "Where in the world do these sit-ins come from?" Mm -hmm. And mind you, these are both both of these people are they're well-known activists. They're in support of what's going on, but both of them are kind of scratching their heads, like, "Where in the world did this come from?" And 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 how did it come into fruition? And and Septimus Clark writes back and says, "I don't know." And again, I paraphrase, "I don't know," but Let's ride with it and see where it goes. And again, part of that concern, right? You talk about John Lewis and his parents being ashamed of him. And again, this, this fluctuates. There are a number of parents who were extremely proud of what their, the, act, the steps that their students were taking. Um, but one of the things which is, 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 is stands out uh, is, 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 again, the, the incredible risk mm -hmm. that students were taking during this period. Uh, many of them end up dropping out of school. Um, you know, as I said before, there's an ebb and flow um, to this thing. And, and again, that's the very nature of student activism itself, is that, you know, you're going to get that ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. School lets out in May. What are you going to do over the summer, right? Student leaders end up graduating. Who's going to take their place? Is anybody going to take their place? Yeah. That, that, that's yeah. the concern that we often have with student activism and, and its ability for longevity, right? But what we see in, in 1960 at A&T and other HBCUs moving into 61, because, you know, when a t students go home, it's Dudley students. High, uh, Dudley is a local high school, black high school in Greensboro. It's Dudley students who step up and keep, and keep the movement going, right? And, and so there's this continuation that takes place throughout the 1960s 
of black colleges proving themselves as a vital seedbed of activism. And we're talking about mass protests, right? And let's be very clear, because, you know, and I, I kind of sense some humor in what you were saying earlier. Everybody and their mama wants to say they marched with Dr. King, right? Everybody wants to say, oh yeah, you know, I, I was out there, I marched. And the truth is many people did not, right? Because of fear of losing their jobs, fear of other forms of reprisal, fears of yeah. racial violence. But black college students, you know, again, these were, yeah. they had, now I don't want to say that black students were, were fearless, um, but again, they didn't have jobs they could be fired from. They didn't have mortgages that could be pulled. Uh, and this is one of the things that made them a major threat uh, uh, moving forward for mass protests. We look at the mass protests which occurred. I talk about this in my chapter on Southern University. We're talking about not hundreds, but thousands of students taking to the streets, rocking Baton Rouge to its core. Again, that's not something which is a knee jerk reaction. That's not something which just happens. That's something which clearly shows that these students have been exposed to an environment that's cultivated them, that's prepared them for this very moment to think of themselves as agents of change. Again, going to going back to what Jabril Kazan said, hey, look, my, my, my teachers told me years ago when I was in elementary school, they were preparing me for this very moment. Right? And that moment comes and black students seize it and it forever transformed the change, the trajectory of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, fast forward a little bit to now. So over the last five or six years, we've had the Black Lives Matter movement. We've had these, incidents, these widespread incidents or well-known incidents of police brutality. Um, so are you seeing what you saw, what you researched from HBCUs? Are, are you seeing that happening now on campuses? Is um, to an extent, activism? right, no, to, to an extent. Uh, and, and when I say to an extent, uh, one, we have to be very careful that um, Black Lives Matter as a moment, as a movement rather, uh, we've only seen it you know, for a few months, right? This thing really kind of exploded on the scene, um, you know, going back to um, this spring in terms of the massive, you know, response to George Floyd's killing. Of course, you can go back to, to Ferguson and other places and, and look at what's taking place in terms of black folks collectively began to speak out. Um, but uh, one of the things I want to be careful with as a social movement historian is, is giving this time to, to breathe, to see where this moment in history is going to take it to see if this is sustainable. And if it's going to be sustainable, I think black colleges can still play a critical role within that, right? And, and so when I say to an extent, yes, we see black college students, uh, and, and again, shout shout out to, to, to all those students who went out and, and voted and, and, and turned Georgia blue and, and played a critical role in shaping the, uh, uh, the election uh, in other states. Uh, particularly in, in the deep south where HBCUs are located. Uh, and, and, and I think their voices are critically important. But my major concern um, moving forward is how do we um, cultivate within these students a not just a sense of, of needing change, but how do we educate them enough to, to understand how they should articulate that change? Uh, and this is something I talk about in, in the conclusion of my book, my epilogue of my book, where I, I highlight on what I refer to as the corruption of the HBCU, what I refer to as the communitas. Uh, these institutions have radically transformed the change in the 80s in terms of what they're teaching, what they're exposing students to. Uh, and, and I think that moving forward, my concern is um, that that very well may um, uh, handicap students' abilities to, to roundly uh, and intelligently um, articulate a, a plan for change moving forward. Specifically, what I'm really just kind of cut to the chase. I'm talking about the um, the, the defunding of humanities mm -hmm. uh, at black college, on black college campuses. There's a great interview from Gwen Patton, who's a former activist out of Tuskegee, uh, who was incredibly heavily involved in the movement in the 1960s. But there's this great interview that she did in the 1980s where she says, you know, look, we were exposed to all of these, these the humanities and social sciences, and, and we were in the midst of Vietnam, but we were also being exposed to speakers like Fannie Lou Hamer and others coming to our campus. You know, how could they not, speaking about Tuskegee administration, how could they not expect us to respond mm -hmm. after, after considering all the things that we have been, we were being exposed to, that we're being taught, right? Uh, and, it, and if STEM is the only thing that's being taught, 
in black colleges. Mm -hmm. STEM is the only thing that's being, let me say, rephrase that, if STEM is the only thing that's being fully funded mm -hmm. <laughs> at these institutions, what role is that gonna play in our ability to educate students in the humanities and social sciences so they can understand the problems that confront humanity, and more importantly, how we can continue to deconstruct white supremacy, how we can continue to, 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 to deconstruct all of the, the social, political, and economic ills that confront our, our communities. Students need to be trained in that, need to be educated in that, and that's exactly what students in, in the civil rights generation have been exposed to, and, and my fear and concern moving forward is that black colleges need to find a way um, to, to return back to those roots. Shout out to, to Prairie View a and uh, Prairie View a and just launched a, uh, um, a racial study center. Uh, and so they're gonna be studying race mm -hmm. and, and racism in America. But we don't see that enough, right? You know, in the last three, two, maybe two years, we've seen an, an abundance of, 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 of research dollars pouring into black colleges, scholarships being funded. I don't know if that's white guilt or what moving right now, but you know, schools like Morehouse and Howard and, 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 and Spelman, you know, a lot of donations coming in and that's great. But how about funding the humanities? How about funding social sciences on these campuses? Why can't these institutes um, create uh, um, centers which study racism? And therefore, again, bring us policy, right? Bring us transfer, bring us ideas where we can, as I said before, attack this. And this is what I want and hope for, for black colleges. I think, and again, it's not, as I often say when I'm talking about this, I'm not trying to denigrate STEM. I'm not trying to suggest that black colleges should not be involved in that, but we should not ignore the humanities at these institutions. And in doing so, I think we can help our students form a proper blueprint for how we can continue to engage in this type of work. Is that effort to become more STEM centric, uh, a matter of just being able to get more dollars in or to be, to consider themselves more competitive with, you know, a and is more competitive now with UNC. a and is the largest black college in the country now. And you guys will, no, them, you know. Yeah, and absolutely. It's definitely a part of that. And again, therein lies it's sort of a catch-22 situation. Yeah. Right? You know, black colleges, which have been deliberately underfunded for years, systemically underfunded for years, are playing catch-up. And, and again, you know, shout out to my alma mater, Auntie, that's done an incredible job in, in catching up. Now, Auntie is an incredible STEM school um, that supports, again, research in, in top-notch top uh, uh, research, rather, in, in engineering and tech and business. Those fields, again, are critically important. Uh, but, you know, I, I go back to the words of Rodney Higgins. Rodney Higgins was a professor of political science at, at uh, Southern University in the 1950s. Rodney Higgins predicted this. He actually gave a speech at the social science, uh, a national social science uh, convention, uh, where he warned that uh, we were going to see STEM fields emerging in the 1950s. Of course, we got the aerospace, you know, uh, moment kind of emerging. Put a man on the moon, on the moon, and, and, and Rodney Higgins said this is going to spell disaster for black colleges' ability to again continue to critique. Uh, uh, um, not just critique, but also again create policy and solutions um, to help us deal with this. And and God knows we need solutions to this, Ernie. I mean, I think that you know what we're clearly seeing is that white supremacy is still a major issue within this country. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I hope that again HBCUs and all the funding that's beginning to come uh, to these institutions can find the wherewithal to also support the humanities and fully fund the humanities and social sciences so we can hopefully come up with some solutions uh, to some of these problems that were they're still plaguing us. Okay, we had a comment from a, from our listener, um, Clarence Fisher. I'm gonna read just part of his question. Uh, why are HBCUs still struggling? And let me ask, let me add to that point. Do you, where do you see HBCUs in the next 20, 30 years? Because there have been a lot of predictions that you know we're gonna be down to 70 or whatever. I think we're not at, we're at 103 now. So why are they struggling and where do you see us next 50 years or so? Well, you know, actually, I'm going I'm to shout out your piece, Ernie. You, you did a, a brilliant piece on HBCUs and the current state of HBCUs. I guess that was about two years ago. Yes. That AJC ran a series mm -hmm. uh, on this. And I think one of the things, one of the conclusions that, that you all arrived, and I, I agree with this, is that, uh, you know, every situation is different. Again, you know, you look at a school like North Carolina a and um, they're doing well. You look at a school like Barbara Scotia, not so much. Mm -hmm. right? You look at a school like Morris Brown, even though Morris Brown just received its accreditation uh, or is in the process of, of being reaccredited. Mm -hmm. um, this is 
school, which, you know, for the most part had closed its doors yeah. um, for the last few years. Uh, and so, you know, these stories uh, of success uh, are, are sprinkled in with stories of, of pain and, and, and closure. Uh, and, you know, I think that part of the problem is that we've never fully um, honestly had the conversation about systemic racism and white supremacy and how it's impacted and affected these institutions in terms of funding. Over the years. These are schools which, have, again, were deliberately defunded by state mm -hmm. legislatures, um, by the federal government. Uh, and that plays a critical role in hamstringing their abilities to adjust and survive. Again, I talk about this in, in my epilogue as well, in the epilogue of the book, uh, is that, you know, when, with, the, with the ending of, not the ending, but uh, the integration of sports in the late 1960s and 1970s, you began to see the, the best uh, elite black athletes being recruited by predominantly white institutions, which flooded these institutions with all types of sponsorship dollars and, 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 and prize dollars from winning these bowl games. You know, I attended, I went to grad school at the Ohio State University and, and Ohio State University is like a, it's like a city unto itself. They're constantly building, but they're also constantly cashing checks. Right. Right, from being present in bowl games. And that is built off of the success of black athletes, right? Black athletes who once attended, almost exclusively attended HBCUs. Uh, and so, you know, part of it is systemic. I think one of the things that we've seen over the last, um, you know, few years, and shout out to, to HBCUs in Maryland, shout out to HBCUs in Mississippi, um, we've seen really sort of an attempt by um, uh, representatives of those schools to say, pay us what you owe us, mm -hmm. right? To take these states to court, uh, to sue them for years of, 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 of being underfunded. In, in essence, it's a form of reparations for these institutions. Again, mm -hmm. we look at, uh, uh, I believe it was the Ayers case in Mississippi, uh, where, where they um, promoted that and pursued that, and in doing so, they want a settlement. As I said before, I think Maryland uh, just successfully won a settlement as well, where we're going to see increased funding for HBCUs in those states. Uh, and honestly, Ernie, that's a that's a case that every HBCU in this country can and should make, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. Is that these institutions, as I said before, were systemically and deliberately underfunded, and it's very much impacted and affected their bottom line, their abilities to thrive. Um, their abilities to, to expand, uh, particularly compared to uh, um, their counterparts, predominantly white institutions. Uh, and, and again, it's not, I mean, keeping doors open at, on college campuses is a struggle everywhere. Yeah. Uh, a, number, a number of institutions, even PWIs, are, are struggling with this, especially in this current climate. Uh, but, you know, again, we cannot deny and dismiss and ignore the fact the HBCUs along with almost every other facet of, of black life were deliberately and systemically underfunded. Uh, and, and that we should come to a conclusion that we need to make amends for that in the society. Uh, mm -hmm. If we're going to truly uh, be a society based on equity, um, mm -hmm. that we need to reinvest in these institutions uh, who played a critical role in reshaping the political and social contours of, of America. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned about uh, Ohio State, you, you talked about the football players or the, the athletes you know, who formerly were going to black colleges, were formerly going to Wilberforce or Howard to play football. Central State. Think, this is part of a question from Tony. How do you think the opening up of white colleges to black students, black athletes, as well as black academics, um, how has that affected black colleges? And have you seen a shift over recently, and I don't know if it's anecdotal or not, that people say, hey, I'm gonna to go to black colleges Black colleges is, are a safe space. You got Deion Sanders, who's the, now the um, football coach at Jackson State, and he mm -hmm. wants to bring in all these five-star football players, steal them away from the University of Mississippi and bring them to Jackson State. So are you seeing a, um, a, a swarm of black college students going back to black colleges, or is this all yeah. anecdotal? Well, you know, <laughs> it may be anecdotal, but, you know, I think that uh, we are on the verge of possibly seeing a renaissance. Okay. Um, um, in the in the legacy of these institutions, um, and, and again, this is something that I also talk about in the epilogue of the book. Uh, as I talk about the corruption of the HBCU space, I also talk about what is now, right? What is present now? And I think what is present now um, is you, you see people like Beyonce celebrating Black college culture and Black band culture. Um, you see a number of high-profile athletes 
um, mm-hmm. saying, you know what, I'm going. To, I want to. I want the the black experience at HBC. I want to, especially within this increased hostile environment that we live in, where we see racial animosity um, bubbling over once again. It certainly, it isn't created by this moment. It, you know, white supremacy is not new, right? But we definitely see hostilities bubbling up uh, in society, and these these hostilities exist. On predominantly white institution camp on the campuses of predominantly white institutions, and the mm-hmm. students are aware of that. They're exposed to that, and many of them are, are, are thinking about returning to these shelters in a time of storm, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and being nurtured within this space. And it's not just students, but again, as you mentioned, high-profile athletes. Again, shout out to to uh, uh, to my alma mater, North Carolina a who just signed a, a four-star basketball recruit this oh, week. Yeah. Yeah. That is uh, that's not something which is regular. <laughs> for HBCUs. And so I think many of these young folks are beginning to to slowly say, you know what, why not HBCUs? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and again, this may be uh, um, uh, just a, a a flicker in the dark, or, or maybe it will catch a flame, fully a flame. Um, who's, who's to say? But one thing is very clear is that, um, you know, these are institutions which have, as I said before, the ebb and flow uh, is something which is ha, has been a major part of of, of the experience of, of, of black colleges. You look at the 1980s and 1990s again. Something I talk about in my book, where black colleges kind of experienced yet another renaissance. Right, yeah. we saw a different world. This television Ooh, show, two days, and, days and, yeah. and people were wearing black college gear, and and thing, it became popular. And we see that again today. I'm sure many of you have seen the support black colleges. Uh, sweatshirts and 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 again, as I said before, people like Beyonce and so many celebrities talking about the importance and need of of HBCU. So uh, you know, it, it's yet to, to to be seen. You know what this is going to mean for the future of these institutions. It's one thing to uh, engage in popular success and, and be popular uh, amongst. Uh, um, in terms of uh, impacting and affecting black popular culture. Um, but it's a whole nother thing uh, in terms of what that's going to mean for the economic bottom line of these institutions and whether they'll be able to survive. So hopefully it doesn't just bring interest. Hopefully it will bring dollars. Hopefully it'll bring, it'll mean that alumni say, hey, we should open up our pocketbooks and give more. We need to support these institutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and hopefully that's the direction that all of these institutions are headed in. Mm-hmm. Now you mentioned uh, Beyonce, but there's another superstar out there that we've uh, found out about over the last few months, uh, especially the last month, and that's uh, Kamala Harris, the new right. vice president-elect, who's a graduate of Howard University, who's a AKA a black woman. Talk a little bit about how her ascension and how the fact that she went to Howard University, and there was a whole push from black colleges and black Greek sororities to kind of you know mobilize to support her. Talk a little bit about what her what she means to HBCUs. You know, I've had the opportunity to to talk about her quite a bit. I, I've done a couple of interviews now with folks who want to know ans- the answer to that that same question. And you know, she is she is one of many. We are extremely proud of of Kamala Harris and and, and this reaching this office of of you know stature and being the vice president of the United States is is certainly incredible. Um, but Stacey Abrams is a product of Spelman. Mm-hmm. Keisha Lance Bottoms is a product of Florida A and M. Uh, Reverend Raphael, Raphael Warnock is a product of, of Morehouse. I think what it shows is that HBCUs are still engaged uh, mm-hmm. in fostering an environment of leadership and activism. Uh, again, Kamala Harris, Senator Harris, are now Vice, vice, vice President-elect Kamala Harris. You know, she attended Howard you know, during one of those golden ages. She's there in, yeah. in, in, the, in the mid-1980s, where again, black colleges are kind of re-entering into the space of, of popularity. You know, what's going on at Howard that you know, people are talking about divesting from, from, from a, a apartheid and, and, and engaging in an anti-apartheid movement. They're also taking up issues with uh, um, racism and paternalism as it exists on those, on those campuses. And so those students who attended HBCUs in the 80s and 90s are now in critical positions of leadership, not just in politics either, but also in in, in popular culture. We look at Ta Nehisi uh, Coates. Uh, wow. We look at, at at Ibram X. Kendi, a good friend of mine, who's a Florida A and M grad. Uh, Coates, who's a Howard University grad. We look at Ernie Suggs, who's a North Carolina Central grad. I mean, you know, we need these voices 
within these very important spaces um, to argue for um, the necessity of these institutions uh, and, and, and the importance of these institutions. And I, I truly believe that Kamala Harris is going to use that platform um, to continue uh, calling for support uh, for black colleges. Uh, but she certainly has reinvigorated interest in these institutions. Uh, and as I said before, she's not alone. There's a, a pantheon of who's who in black America who, who are products of these institutions. Uh, mm -hmm. That's something I'm sure she's very well aware of. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned this uh, earlier. Uh, you know, both of us growing up in North Carolina, and when it was time for us to choose a college, one of the things that they talked about when, you, when I picked Central over Carolina was mm -hmm. that Carolina was more of the real world. And my argument has always been that Central was more of the real world because I knew at Central I could be the editor of the school paper, that I right. could be the SDA president, that, you know, this girl who's this dark-skinned girl from wherever in North Carolina, you know, not to say dark-skinned because, you know, these are just the kind of things that we think about. She could be Miss NCCU and that Kamala Harris can be the vice president or possibly the president of the United States. So at all, you know, in, in, when you talked about Warnock and, and Keisha and all these people who are just, we just know them as people, but they went to black colleges and they're succeeding now. And this is what we were taught on these campuses that we could right. succeed and that we would always do well. And I think I tweeted out before when, when after the election that this is what they taught us to do from day one on campus, that we could be what Kamala Harris is, what Kamala Harris has achieved. Without question. And you know, as a, you and I, Ernie, are not the only HBCU folks on this call. And, and I, I'm pretty sure we had time to, 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 to give a testimony, right? And yeah. let people testify about what HBCUs have done in their lives. I'm sure many of them would say that it fueled their freedom dreams. It, it very much gave them a model, as I said earlier, of what can be, right? Uh, and, and as I said before, these are spaces which never called into question our humanity which never called into question our dignity. Uh, but yet you have black college students who attend PWIs who are exposed to that type of hostile environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's harmful and it's hurtful. Uh, yeah. and, and many of them have talked about it and documented it uh, in their own memoirs or, you know, again, I've, I've read stories about these in newspapers. In fact, I added some of them to, to the book of people saying, look, you know, I've, th these spaces have to be reformed. You know, Florida A&M University and Harvard University are both colleges, but mm -hmm. it's very clear that these are colleges which are very distinct in terms of, of what they've been called to do. Right. Harvard, you know, very much was a prop uh, in terms of promoting white supremacy in America. And this is a, this is a historical truism. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, they very much uh, uh, they were studying uh, how African-Americans lacked humanity. At these institutions and in doing so it powered not just slavery it powered the menstrual era it powered policy which shaped jim crow meanwhile at places like florida a m and southern and north carolina a t and north carolina central these students were being exposed to again race consciousness and cultural nationalism and idealism something i refer to in my book as a second curriculum a second curriculum and this powered their freedom dreams mm -hmm. this again taught them that you 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 were not some you, you were somebody Right, that you did, you came from a long legacy of, of 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 strong heritage, and that again, that we need you to be engaged in the freedom movement. They're completely different narratives and completely different spaces. I, I joked with the interviewer a while back that you know, I guess it was last year or the year before last, we saw all these images coming out from politicians in in the 1980s and 1970s who attended PWIs who were caught in blackface and, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, so, you know uh, hey, this, that's what they, you know, use for entertainment and 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 uh, um, amusement. Mm -hmm. Pretty radically different space from what HBCUs represented. Yeah. Right. And, and so, you know, and I think this is something that PWIs have to have to deal with moving forward is to to assessing the type of space that they provide and how it's really kind of propped up animosity and white supremacy in our society uh, and how HBCUs have really done the opposite and in doing so have bought us moments and movements like the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and beyond. All right. So I think uh, I'm not, I don't see Tony, but I think we're at 759. So I think uh, we're about to, yes. to wrap up. So yeah, please. go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to just ask you, Jelani, uh, tell us how people can find you, you and find your work and what are you working on now? What's going on with you now? Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I avoid social media like the plague for the most part. I am on Instagram. Uh, you can find me there at 
Dr. Jelani Favors uh, on Instagram. Um, not a big fan of Twitter and, and Facebook. I think yeah, it's I was looking for you on Twitter, today, but I couldn't find you. <laughs> yeah, I know my Twitter handle, but you can. I'm definitely on Instagram, and uh, you can you can find me there. You can also find my book um, wherever books are sold: uh, Amazon, Target, Walmart, your local independent bookstore. Um, so um, the, the book has done well, and, and I'm extremely I'm extremely happy about that. The next project uh, is actually looking. I'm, I'm moving away from. Um, um, student activism and, and studying institutions, uh, and, but I'm still engaged in social movement history. And I'm talking about a, a, a 1898 lynching case um, that happened in, in Lake City, South Carolina, uh, where a, a black postmaster by the name of Fraser Baker, uh, he and his one-year-old daughter were lynched. Uh, and, 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 you know, the house was shot up, uh, their bodies were, were burned, um, and, and the family, it was five others, ended up escaping and, and ultimately heading to Boston. But it produced a federal case because he was a, he was a black postmaster. And that in itself was a rarity, right, to actually have a, a federal lynching trial. But in 1898, we saw the, the lynching trial, uh, the Fraser Baker case, which was an international sensation. Of course, it ended up uh, um, uh, exonerating uh, the men who were held responsible um, for his murder. But uh, one of the things I want to get at in that book is really dealing with how whiteness responds when it's under threat. Uh, because the whole reason why um, Fraser Baker is lynched is because simply he was a black postmaster. Mm. And they considered to be out of space. He was considered to be a threat uh, um, to, to white society. And white society has often reacted in a very hostile manner when it felt as though uh, it was losing whiteness. And in fact, that's the, 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 the preliminary title of the book is Losing Whiteness, Power, Privilege, and Murder in Post-Reconstruction Post South Carolina. And so I think in the, in the Fraser Baker case, not only do we see a very important legal case, a federal case of 1898, we also hopefully get a better understanding of how whiteness has often responded in a very hostile manner when it feels as though it's losing its currency. And I think that's what we're seeing now in society. So many people, uh, um, uh, white Americans, not all certainly, but a number of white Americans believe that whiteness is somehow losing its currency and they find heroes and people like Trump, they find heroes uh, and people like the conservative right uh, who are, who are championing their causes mm -hmm. uh, on, in social media, on the conservative airways. Uh, and so, uh, as I said before, I hope that the book will be uh, an illumination of not just that case, but um, the current struggles that we have uh, with race and with whiteness in America. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks a lot. And I look forward to seeing that. I'm sure all of our listeners look forward to seeing that. But while we're waiting for that, I want everybody to make sure you pick up a copy of Shelter in the Time of Storm. Can you all see that? How Black Colleges Fostered Generations of Leadership and Activism. And I want to thank you for coming aboard today. I know we had, you know, with the whole storm, we had to postpone this and you know, have it again. But I want to thank you for coming. Thank you as an ag, as an eagle to have, a, <laughs> to have a, a nice, intelligent, civil conversation. Absolutely. Until next football season until, uh, you know, we play y'all twice next year. Absolutely. And Ernie, if I, I just want to take a second to thank Tony Clark. Uh, to thank the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library. I was mentioning to you uh, to you guys earlier that I always love book talks at the Carter Center. And, and so I, one of my great regrets is that this wasn't able to happen in person. Uh, but I, I thank you, everyone who came out. Uh, and, and thanks, Tony. And again, to the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library. Uh, hats off to you and to all the work you all do. And, thank yeah, Brad, and Jelani, uh, Please uh, put us on your calendar when your book is your next book is ready. Uh, hopefully, we can do that one that in person. I am just delighted. This was a fascinating uh, program uh, tonight. As Ernie said, the book is called "Shelter in in a Time of Storm," and I think we've got storms going on right now. Um, uh, it's a it's a great book. Yeah, I, I, encourage you to pick it up. Also, um, I would encourage you on uh, Thursday evening at six o'clock, we're partnering with the James Weldon Johnson Institute at Emory University, and they have a program. They're having a panel discussion. It's called 2020 Election, What Happened and What's Ahead? Uh, and I, it will be a fascinating online discussion. You can go either to the James Weldon Johnson uh, Institute uh, website or ours and, and make a reservation then. But again, thank you both, Ernie and Chelani. It's been wonderful. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.